five now. Hello, guys. All right, so we're getting started now. Uh, this is Gus. Uh, we just finished a panel with uh, students a moment ago, and that went really great. I think we covered a lot of information that it's relevant to all of you who are thinking about applying to AUC or who are thinking about medical school in general terms. So we covered a lot of good information. We had a great panel of students. Right now, I have a wonderful panel of faculty who have been involved with AUC in different areas or who are involved at AUC in different areas, and I want to get their perspective on what it, it means to teach at AUC, what it means to be involved here. And this is very valuable because uh, those of you are probably going to be, if you come to AUC, you're going to be either teaching, I mean, learning from these professors, or you're going to be, depending on what these professors uh, uh, impart and what, you know, what uh, the leadership they have. So it is important that we really go over that. So I'm going to uh, uh, flip the screen right here, and I'm going to introduce you to our fantastic panel of faculty. Uh, so wonderful. All right. So we have Dr. Uh, Mohammed Aziz on the right. We're going to go right to left on the pat on the on the screens. Then we have Dr. Terry uh, Basie, and we have Dr. Mark Quirk. And uh, these are incredible members of our faculty who have uh, in different shapes or form they have been involved at UC for a number of years. Uh, so let's go with uh, Dr. Aziz first. And Dr. Aziz, can you introduce yourself? Where are you from? Uh, a little bit about your professional background and what you do at AUC. Uh, hi, everybody. It's my pleasure uh, to uh, be with you. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Aziz, and you call me Dr. Zizo. For okay. short, so to you, the word Zizo. That's me. <laughs> uh, I joined uh, AUC uh, two years ago. I'm glad I did this. Good. And uh, right now I teach in uh, uh, university here. I teach uh, pathology and uh, sometimes I do histology. And in a way, being an MD, I'm available for any teaching uh, as needed. Uh, I am an MD and I have like lost 30 years practicing medicine in the United States in the tumor diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, mainly breast and the bones of tissue and, and cytology. Okay. At the same time, I was teaching during the same time <coughs> with the New York Medical College in Valhalla uh, because I was practicing in the city. My training also in city mean Manhattan. And uh, also... <laughs> that is the city, right? We call it the city. <laughs> going to the city. So those of you who are familiar with New York, you know what I mean when I say right. the city. We mean Manhattan. <laughs> and uh, after that, last 10 years before I came here to AUC, uh, I was involved in uh, North Shore LIJ Health System, which is now North Wells uh, System. I joined in 2010, and that was the time of the consolidation of 17 hospital. Okay. So I had a senior administration level at the time, and that was part of the initial consolidation of the system. Uh, for a period of time, maybe two, three uh, years, I had exposure to uh, private practice also as a pathologist. Uh, I owned the lab of Omega Path Diagnostic in upper, uh, upstate New York. And uh, I bought this lab and I did practice there for about three years. Okay. So uh, I think uh, uh, through the discussion, we'll learn more uh, and more. Right, right. And I appreciate Dr. Aziz. And you've been with AUC for how long now? Uh, two years now. Two years. Great, great. Uh, so thank you uh, for sharing your story. Uh, Terry, Basie, how, you've been here for a while as well. I've been seen? here for about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. I was recruited initially as um, a person who could forward the simulation program. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a nurse by education, a doctorally prepared nurse. Okay. I've spent most of my career at the University of Iowa and in the College of Nursing mm -hmm. in the last 20 years in simulation. So wow. I'm heavily involved in the um, International Simulation Societies. And so that's what drew me here is they needed some simulation expertise and um, I was happy to come and provide that. Right. Um, I had lived on uh, a different Caribbean island for a while, so okay. I understood um, 
the lifestyle, what sorts of, of expectations um, I would have of, of, of what it means to live outside the U.S. Right. And um, was really happy to be able to come back to the Caribbean at that time. I have also recently taken on the, um, the position of being the course director for ICM-1, Good. which is the Congratulations. Of Clinical Medicine. And which is a lot of fun. So it's really the first course that students start to practice their physician skills, and and um, it's so not much of the course is about practicing communication with our standardized patients. So we have a large standardized patient program that is that provides a lot of really good practice right. to our students. And the in introduction to clinical medicine, ICM, the clinical training has expanded incredibly in the yes. past, I want to say, in the, even in the past few years, because right. we didn't even have first semester, right? It wasn't part of the right. first semester. Um, uh, it wasn't part of the first semester curriculum, but now it is, right? right? So they can start right. taking introduction to clinical medicine. And we did a tour just a moment ago. You saw Terry. If you, if you see the tour that we did a moment ago uh, through different parts of the campus, we stopped by. Terry's office, and she has a very distracting view uh, from her office. It's just a view of the bay, and uh, I was I was really joking around. I'm like, you don't even need a background picture on your computer because you just look around and you have an incredible background yeah. behind you. So thank you for all you do, uh, and uh, great. Thank you for also for your feedback, Dr. Mark Quirk. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to have you as well. You're a leader as far as uh, the school is concerned. You, you, your leadership is so important to all of us. And I want to hear a little bit about your background, where you're from, professional background, of course, and what, what are you involved? Great, thanks, Gus. Um, it's, it's really an honor to share the table with uh, these two faculty. Both Zizo and Terry are, are tremendous faculty members and uh, really, uh, I think, the, the best of teachers that I've been exposed to. Uh, and, and I've been in medical education for quite a while. I'm the Senior Associate Dean uh, for Medical Education here at AUC. I've been here just a little bit, around the same time as, as Terry, so about four years in one way or another. Um, I became full-time about three years ago. Before that, I was consulting with AUC. Um, and before that, I was a Vice President at the American Medical Association. Uh, where I was the director of a program called Accelerating Change mm -hmm. in Medical Education. And we uh, really reached out to, we had a, a grant program where we had applicants from all of the medical schools in the country, the U.S., and we chose, a, at the time, 12, it was now up to 20, schools for uh, really their innovation in medical teaching and medical education and awarded them over a million dollars each, worked with them in a consortium. Uh, the reason I went into that a little bit is to just uh, let you know as, as students, prospective students out there, that our faculty and our uh, curriculum are really second to none. Um, and that's based on my experience, I think, with a lot of different medical schools. So I was with the AMA for, for a while before that, I was 35 years at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where I was on the faculty um, in clinical departments, pretty much all of the clinical departments. Um, I was a vice chair of a clinical department. I was associate dean at the school. Um, and again, it was a, a long experience, great school. Um, but again, I, I feel AUC really does a great job uh, with curriculum. And, uh, we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, my own background, I'm a medical educator, an educational psychologist by training, um, and again, have been in medical education since uh, 1977. And uh, so have seen a lot of change in medical education, a lot of different models. And um, really here, I think we're doing some, some really great things around teaching and learning. Right, and medical education has evolved quite a bit now with the use of technology, so much so now, and we have evolved now into allowing students uh, watching the, 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 even the class, the lectures, the classes they can view online now, they can view the recording, correct? So that's something new in the use of technology with every day being implemented. What are some of the, if you can give us a little bit more of a context as far as what the curriculum is like. That is a question we get a lot, by the way. Those of you watching, 
I don't know if you're wondering about this, but yeah, we do get a lot of questions about the curriculum. And you know, with so many different schools in the US and DO programs and then in the Caribbean, it is a, a subject that uh, uh, sometimes makes a difference on where people decide to go. So without further ado, if you can let us a little bit, uh, yeah. uh, give us some insight. Sure, I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes on the broad structure and then I really wanna hear the, the faculty who will you know, enable you to get a better understanding in depth of both the basic sciences and I think the clinical sciences here. Um, I'm gonna talk about the curriculum here on the island. The curriculum that we have in the clinical arena is, uh, you know, we could talk about that a little bit later if, if uh, you know, you wanna talk about that, Gus, as well. But to, to give you an idea of what we're doing here, which is really unique, is, is we're focusing on integration. And I, what I mean by that is that when physicians practice, they don't practice and, and express their knowledge or apply their knowledge in discrete areas of basic science. They put it together. And that's right. the key to clinical medicine, is to put together your knowledge base so that you can effectively diagnose and treat and manage patients, as well as deal with populations of patients. So we realize that here at AUC, and instead of the traditional disciplinary silos or boundaries, we're moving toward a, an integration platform where our semester faculty are working together to teach topics or, or content areas like molecular and cell biology and anatomy and histology and putting those together rather than uh, doing them separately. Uh, the idea is to do that and especially focus on cases because cases are really authentic learning. Right. And that's where our learners are gonna be applying their wares, applying what they know and their skills to patient care. So as Dr. Aziz will tell you, that's what he's done for all of his life, is to put material together um, and to solve problems. And, and that's really where we wanna move in terms of our early stages of curriculum. Not to do things in such a separate, segmented way, but to really start to bring together our, our students' knowledge so that eventually you, you gain and you gather things in a way that really becomes an, an expert way of thinking. And that's what we want to do is focus on uh, expertise. And you know, some schools are doing very similar things in the country. Right. Uh, others are doing it in Europe. Um, but case-based learning has re really become popular uh, as we're moving ahead in medical education, and I believe we're really second to none in, in putting that together with our group of faculty. So Great. I think that broadly gives you an idea of what the preclinical uh, curriculum looks like. And maybe Terry could tell us more about ICM, and certainly uh, Zizo can get into, I think, a lot of the details around histology, which he taught for a year for us. And, you know, tremendous teacher in pathology and, and histology and has that integrative perspective. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Pork. Yes, if, that, that's actually a great, a great segue. If we can go right into uh, your daily, uh, your daily uh, routines as, as being professors and teaching. So uh, let's go with Terry. Terry, so what, do you, what, do you, what is typically a day in the life of, you, of your, as a, as a you know, teaching ICM and uh, what students can expect? Right, so there is an ICM course in every semester mm -hmm. that the students are here. So beginning with ICM-1, where we really uh, focus on the patient being the center. And so we, we have students learn and practice patient-centered interviewing. And we start a little bit on the physical exam. Mm -hmm. um, ICM-2, 3, and 4 each take a part of the body and really talk about more in depth parts of the physical exam and continue to um, have students practice um, very specific techniques, whether it's how to um, discuss sensitive to topics with patients, right. um, how to encourage or motivate patients to um, um, change behavior. So every course really takes on a different part of that. And then ICM-5 really is um, a large course that they do a lot of simulation in. So 
that's their um, their way to have people. Um, all students get the same experience with this simulation, right. and then uh, as preceptors, faculty are and with the students, they're able to guide and correct, unlike you could do in a clinical situation with a patient. So right. there's there's a huge advantage to our fifth semester students being able to do a simulation. Absolutely. In, in third semester, Mark was talking about um, our integration simulations. We have, for the last five semesters, um, created a new case around the third semester classes, which means microphysiology, pathology, and ICM-3. Okay. And one of the content that's shared across all the courses is talking something about the lungs, especially physiology, pathology, and of course, med micro, they talk right. about microorganisms no matter where they are. Right. So the faculty get together, create a case, and um, then we present the case to the students. And what happens, mm. and that's usually so far the, fir the student's first example with high fidelity simulation, is the students say, oh wow, now I understand what it means to have to think on my feet at the bedside. Right. And now, hmm, I, I don't know that I'm being, I've been studying correctly, because you expect me to think about microbiology while I'm interviewing the patient and and right. put all of these together and it's an amazing experience after they do the simulation then we spend an hour debriefing with a member of the faculty from each department so helping the students bring that all back together to um, help them put that patient story together and, and talk about what's going on so it's a it's a great experience in in integration, and as um, course director of ICM one now, we're doing we're developing the same thing, and because um, it's all about the patient, all about the patient's story. So that's really where we started with the case, right. and are developing. So what parts of this case? Um, because people have had this content in, in anatomy, what are the cues that the students have to listen to? Right. And then is there a genetic part to this case? Right. You know, and, and bringing in um, parts of each, each course that the students are taking during their first semester. Right. And so um, we will roll that out for the first time in July. But really see forward is we'll be making a new case every semester and at least the first semester having several of these integrated case studies every semester. So our simulation program is growing. We're always looking at how to how to engage students and make it um, interactive and something they can hook their experiences right. to. And they have all the takeaways before going into clinical medicine. So they have the opportunity to work with, in this case, the simulation equipment, the simulation right. men, the sim men, and they can uh, they can practice all different cases and situations. I was really impressed. I mean, I'm not an expert on the subject, but uh, last uh, there's video for those of you watching. There's video when we were doing a tour of the clinical lab, the introduction to clinical medicine lab, and uh, the simulation men went into cardiac arrest, and it was code blue, and the students came in and they were doing. Uh, all these different procedures to bring the patient back, uh, which is was the simulation. Uh, so the patient can die. The, there are definite things that are uh, that are part of the learning experience, but at the, at the same time, it's not. Um, you're not actually uh, affecting a real person's right. life. <laughs> so you're preparing for that, of course. So I think that was really vital for me uh, as a as a as an spectator, I guess you know, watching this. And yeah. uh, and I think those of you who are watching and thinking about medicine. I recommend that you watch those videos. And I, again, Terry, you have an incredible passion. I can sense how passionate you are about the subject. So that, that speaks a lot about our faculty. Dr. Aziz, can oh, I go ahead. One more thing, sorry. Uh -huh, no. um, and I've been attached to several major medical schools in, mm -hmm. in the US, and they don't have simulation centers like this. Mm -hmm. My experience as a nurse, the medical schools were coming into the nursing schools to utilize our equipment because they just weren't 
there yet. And it was more at, at the resident level that they use the high fidelity simulation. So in my experience, having this sort of simulation center in, a, in this medical school is very unique and it's, it's different and it's a great opportunity. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I've heard that from other, even when we have pre-med advisors and professionals from other schools, they come in, they do say, I hear that is a common uh, uh, comment that I hear. So we have a question before we go, Dr. Aziz. We have a question here. Someone's asking, how does student go about getting involved in research? How early into medical school can someone start getting involved in research? I don't know if this is a topic you I may can, be familiar uh, with. I can get involved. Oh, so perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Aziz, take it away. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, I have been in uh, Manhattan and uh, Long Island in uh, two major medical schools. And I was doing this beside my practice. Two years ago, I decided I'm going to full-time here. So I'm just doing consultation online. But my full-time now is just for teaching. Uh, we can talk about teaching when the time comes, but to answer specifically your question, I have been dealing for more than 30 years with students, uh, residents, fellows, even uh, junior attendings uh, rotating in uh, uh, our hospitals and uh, at some point, as I said, I was running a major department in 17 hospitals. So mm -hmm. I had exposure from all levels. Uh, when you are here, the students, you are here for, uh, uh, in your journey to be a physician, you have two years mainly here, this is a basic science, then you have two years which is a clinical science. And I have to tell you, uh, being one who went through what you are going through, what you will go through, I know that. I just want to tell you that the first two years that the basic science are uh, generally the most intense two years because it's more or less feeding, feeding, feeding in a short time. Then the two years when you go to the clinical, this is really uh, where uh, you will enjoy it. Why? Because you're already in the hospital, you had excellent background from say the program that uh, Terry mentioned, but your time in these two years will be making sense of what you have learning for two years. So the comment here about research, generally research uh, needs uh, time and uh, need consistency uh, in uh, the commitment. Uh, that's why my general advice is uh, the best time for uh, research or projects are the third and fourth year. You are already in the hospital. You have the charts already. You will be amazed if you know that. And uh, you will ask if any of you have friends in the university here, how close I am with you, not only after you leave from here. I taught already about nine semesters. And I am close to them And uh, maybe before they start getting to practice. Uh, I communicate with you during this uh, three, third and fourth year. I guide you through it in the other chart. So this is the time to do that. Now, during this two years, I think the best practice for you is maybe occasional uh, case reports. So, so this can get you exposure to what research is. You get to it uh, in the simplest form. You will learn how to communicate with journal and the faculty will assist you in how to write a case and this will be simple because it doesn't need all the complication associated with uh, uh, submitting a project. So specifically to answer your question, faculty here are ready to get you prepared knowing the priority of the time. Uh, and you would be surprised if you know that uh, in a year there were seven, eight cases already published. Wow by medical students at five, at, uh, as a, a first author. So seven medical students here in the school in their first and second year of medical training. If you hit their name in Google, you will get the first return at the moment. So chances are there. Wow. Just wanna see you, but just come here. And we do, yes, and we do get a lot of questions and I'm glad that, uh, that we have that question come in because it, it is something that's quite important to many individuals. They're thinking about it. So, uh, yeah. Dr. Kirk, just, I'm just going to add to that, and then we'll go back yes. to things. So, um, there are. I think that that's an absolute good portrayal because you know students can start very early here and, and work on research 
and it can be research and ed medical education. And just to give you an example, if, if people want to check the, the special issue of medical teacher that's coming out in August, it's a, a highly respected journal in medical education. We have one of our uh, one of the articles in there, and the special issue itself features five articles by people, faculty who are associated with AUC, and I edited the issue, but the, the article by the students, the student is the lead author on this article, and these students actually did research with Dr. Aziz's uh, colleague, who was also on the, uh, the article as an author as well, a, a faculty member. So the students are taking the lead as the authors on, a, on an article. These same students have presented a, an app that they developed, which is called Lecture Keeper, and that app has been presented at student at uh, Stanford X, which is a very um, important conference for technology in the U.S. So it can be done, and our students are, uh, you know, these particular students received a grant from wow. Tellum, our parent, parent organization, to work on the project that they have, and they're developing their own app, and we'll be producing that, and we'll be selling that app. Wow. That's remarkable, and yeah, I mean, that, that tells you, especially those of you watching, you can uh, get involved in the research, and there are plenty of positives that come out of that. I mean, these are individuals who are probably, when they apply for resident, that's going to be front and center in their application is their accomplishments, and uh, that's going to uh, have effects down the line as well professionally for them. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and, and of course, professors as well for getting involved all the way. Uh, so I think you know one of the main concerns that we get with uh, also another concern that we or question that we typically get from students is you know they think of medical sciences as being this uh, I think they have an analogy for it is like drinking water out of, out of a, uh, a hydrant it's like you have all this information what sort of tips do you have I mean you've seen obviously different ranges of uh, students and different personalities and so forth. Dr. Assis, what do, you, what do you think it's important to keep in mind for students who are coming into the program? Uh, how they should approach this hydrant, you know, this uh, uh, wave of information? Uh, all I can tell you, if you are considering uh, coming here, I just want to tell anybody who's watching now, uh, when you come here, I will remind you what I'm telling you here. Uh, first, uh, uh, we'll talk about this another maybe uh, discussion, but the unique feeling of family here, family feeling, especially from the uh, faculty. And uh, I teach three semesters, first three and four out of five. Histology, right? I, I teach histology first, and okay. I teach pathology three pathology, and four. Right. So I have at least three semesters I deal with. And all the students, I uh, enforce the point that guys, you are not here alone. Let your family know that you have a family here. Right. You have parents, you have brothers, you have sisters for you here. Now, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because when we teach here, we are actually, we put ourselves in the place of the student. When I teach, I consider myself, I am there, what I'm thinking mm -hmm. and what, what I like and what I don't like. One of the philosophy of teaching here is we here in the university, we make sense of what you are learning. You will not find us here. We don't have the style of projecting slides and reading the slides, no. Uh, the student should know why every slide is projected. And here it brings us to the point that uh, Mark mentioned, the integration. I know we are moving now more and more. Believe it or not, you have three professors getting into the auditorium and now they are presenting together. It happened that I'm a physician, so I am both. So in any subject I teach, I am always throwing my clinical background in this. And I'll give you, if you're listening to me, and as I said, uh, please see me then, because I want you to remind you of this, uh, to remind me of this. My philosophy in teaching, and I believe this is for the most, uh, for, for the majority here. When I have a course, I say I'm teaching pathology, doing this for several months. My goal is mainly three things, mainly three things, and I want to deliver this to you. And they are equally important. There is no one is more important than the other. 
Number one is I want to, after I finish this course, the way I'm delivering it, how much you will have left with you to help you in your clinical rotation and eventually as a physician. You don't take it as this is a course, a chapter finished, oh, we passed, we got A finished. No, no. I make sure, and this is the way of delivery, and now we are getting the integration, we are doing many new things. So, but number one, how much you carry with you. Number two is, let's be realistic, they call us international uh, school. And I hope later I get a chance to make a comment on this because for 25 years I was at the other end. Right. I was in the resident selection committee. So I know exactly about this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is the score in USMD is vital for you. Mm -hmm. So I am very concerned about number two is what kind of a foundation that you will have in your preparation for the USMD. So this is number two. Number three, let's be realistic. We have little bridges to get everywhere. And the immediate bridge would be the current block exam, mm. which is a course I am uh, giving to you. I believe with the integration, with making sense of each thing you are learning and reminding the students all the time that they are students. And uh, so those are the three main objectives I have. And uh, one thing I want to tell you also, it's not enough to be good. <laughs> because I tell you, our school is good. And the proof is, and the doctor work, of course, can you get into this, our uh, uh, matching uh, for residency, the first matching, we are above the 85, which is better than many schools in the United States, and the USMLE, we are also above the 95, first mm -hmm. score. That's but right. to be good is not enough, because you need to maintain how good you are, and there's something called we can be better. And this is right. what we are trying to do. Right. So I'll stop here and uh, we'll be open for... No, they, it, that's great and we're very proud you mentioned the residency placement rates. We do have that information posted on our website. So for those of you watching, definitely that's a good referral to that. Go to our website, check out the residency placement uh, information, 85%. That's something that we're really proud of. Also the USMLE, we're, we're doing really well. Uh, our students are, you are of course as professors, doing a great job because our students are doing well on the, on the back end of it and doing well with the USMLE. And USMLE, by the way, United States Medical Licensing Examination, those of you who are thinking of medical school, that is, and you're gonna hear that a lot, uh, that's, that's how you're gonna be able to become a licensed physician. Uh, Dr. Aziz, you were gonna say something else? Uh, yes, uh, I guess uh, as a follow up to what I was saying, uh, as I said, I'm here for two years, so I taught uh, around nine uh, semesters. Uh, I want you who are listening to me now to know that when you leave here after two years, we are not done. Mm -hmm. uh, the bond is strong uh, with the uh, professors here who are like a family. And I cannot tell you, I am in regular communication with those who are applying for residency. I was there in the other end right. for more than 25 years. I have all the secret at the other uh -huh. end. And we are communicating not only in pathology, because that was my field, but I have tremendous experience as well as many of the faculty here. We share it with you. You are not done when you leave here. Right. And that is, that is key as well in the, in the process of uh, getting a residency and becoming the networking as well when you're uh, having a professor who has contacts, you know, I think it's key when you're applying for residency and Dr. Aziz, I'm sure again that, that Many comes of the faculty very use, valuable. It's a guidance uh, during this uh, process. We work together here right. and uh, Dr. Cork just mentioned the integration. Uh, although we work together uh, generally, but we're getting more and more because remember what I'm saying. It's right. not enough to be good. We can be better. We can be better. I like that. I think I'm going to use that. All right. So, Dr. Quirk, I wanted to go back to uh, a little bit more and kind of get uh, more onto the clinical side of it. And I know it is a very complex, a lot of moving parts, but what are we doing on the clinical side of things uh, as far as yeah. Uh, curriculum? Yeah. We're actually doing, I think, our best work in focusing now on the transition from our preclinical to our clinical. And I, I think in many medical schools, my experience is that that transition can often be the, the most critical area that's overlooked. So what we're looking at now is how to prepare our students early for their clinical experiences. Mm -hmm. And that includes the case-based teaching that I was talking about. 
It includes looking at our Introduction to Clinical Medicine courses, our suite of courses, and being able to um, develop what we call simulated case scenarios for our students. They're called OSCEs, the Objective Structured Clinical Exam. And these are, students will become familiar with these, but these are placing students in the actual scenario of a clinical encounter and having them go through that encounter and practice that encounter, rehearse that encounter because it's so critical. So we're developing our OSCEs here. We're starting our students early so that when they transition and go into the, their clinical sites in all of the, the clinical disciplines, they're ready for that. And that's such an important feature. We're not waiting to train students when they get to the clinical years. We're training them now. We have our physician faculty who are heavily engaged. We have Dr. Basie who is very involved in our simulation center and others who are coming in and helping us put that together. But I think that's the most critical part of that. On the, when you look at the clinical clerkships, we're also doing some incredible things around OSCE training to make things reliable. We have a new learning management system that's rolling out that has all of our seminal cases mm -hmm. that students are expected to focus on. We're developing our faculty. I've been to many of the uh, medical centers in New York and, and in other areas uh, to work with the faculty directly around how to teach students in a clinical setting. So we're really moving on that integration in the preclinical years, the authentication of our curriculum and starting that transition early and then working with the clinical faculty in each of the disciplines. Right. And I think as Dr. Aziz points to, we have the ability to work with students when it comes time for graduation and residency selection. And that's a critical piece. And, and we have many people who can work with the students around the, the right choice of residency, thinking about what type of specialty is best for you as a student, um, and moving beyond and into practice. And um, you know, we're, we're there for the student, and I think that's a critical piece. Right, and it is all interwoven too, because yeah. we're all piecing together. And I know in the past, uh, there was a transition from medical sciences and into clinical sciences that two different aspects of the medical education, and right now they're becoming more uh, seamless. It's becoming more seamless. It's, it's it, that transition that is a big and important aspect of it because they're going away. They're going away from campus onto a clinical site in the United States or in UK. Uh, so that is important, and I think I, I appreciate the fact that you bring that up. I know that we're also implementing, we have um, clinical fellows as well involved, and that is a new, well, relatively new uh, uh, program that we have in place. Uh, I don't know if Terry or if you want to talk a little bit about that uh, and give us some idea of how that works. Sure. So we have clinical fellows that are typically here for about a year and they help us do all, all parts of our ICM curriculum. So we help them learn how to teach what they have just learned and experienced. And so not only um, do they get a broad experience here as fellows, but they learn a lot of skills related to, because um, they're physicians, but now you, they learn how to teach. Right. Um, so, and those are two um, like skills, but they're different skills. And so they help us bring um, some current um, um, medical practice to our students. So one of our fellows is helping our students learn ultrasound. I use our fellows when we do our injection workshops, when we have our intubation workshops. And so they're helping us bring the, the clinical and the practice, aspects, yeah. the practice to, to, the, to the students. And one of the things about the basic science that is so important, there's, there's it's, um, students are learning a lot of facts, and it's important to know facts, but it's also, we try really hard to help students learn how to learn. Right. And so it's not, so at the bedside, they do have to take action on what they have learned. So being able to put things together and not have a separate, I've memorized a lot of things for two years, and now I go to clinical, to the clinical world, 
but helping students understand how to do that early on and what sorts of things they, they, they need, what sorts of skills that they need. Because it really isn't in our technological world now. It's not about how much you know, but can you access it? And can you think about it? So yeah. I always say Make that you critically think you need to know things first. And so this is really, you, you get to understand a lot about, about basic science, and, but we really concentrate on how do you translate that at the bedside. Right, yeah, that is exactly right. So it's all, again, coming together into one, uh, yeah, it's all done in the medical sciences, but getting the introduction into clinical, and then preparing them for the clinical and the real world, mm -hmm. I suppose, what's coming after that medical, as a medical physician. So uh, thank you. I think we will wrap up with all these uh, amount of uh, valuable information that you have all shared. Uh, I think, you know, prospective students who are watching this, and I encourage you to uh, share this video with anyone who's interested in, in the program or anyone interested in medical school, because a lot of this information is, is general, uh, generic in some shape or form. Uh, so. Yes, and Dr. Aziz, you want to say some parting words? Do I have words? like a minute and a half? Because yes. I, think, I think this is very important. Go ahead. If, if we are talking uh, to uh, students or future students, uh, I have to tell you it's me as well as other faculty here, but I can talk about myself. Uh, coming here's experience of a long, long time from New York on the other side of the residency selection. I want to tell you, when you come here, you are called the so-called uh, international graduates. I have to tell you, being there when I looking for 16 positions, say residency, there's a process. We have 800 applicants and we have stages to go through it. Believe me, believe me, and I know what I'm saying. AUC comes absolutely at the top. And even for us, because I, uh, for a long time, I established the criteria for moving from step to step. I have to tell you. Uh, uh, you are listening to me or the, you who are graduated and now you are in the hospitals. Uh, we think of AUC actually is at maybe at the bottom of the American schools. We don't even look at it right. as international school. And I know this very well because we do the residency matching every year. So I want you to uh, understand this. Uh, uh, it's unique, the reputation of the hospital, the, uh, of the uh, school. Uh, is absolutely, I don't think of it really as an international school. Great. And I always, yeah. um, if I can add on to that, I like people to think of this as plan A. This an international medical school exactly. doesn't have to be plan B because this is, um, the faculty here are great, the experience is great, there's all sorts of reasons why people really should have this on, on their plan A and not, not just a plan B. Absolutely. Right, and you're the token of that, of the faculty, the value that that brings into the education. So again, I, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. I know you're, you have very busy schedules and uh, as students appreciate it very much. So thank you, I, uh, you know, I hope that we can get to connect with you later on. Uh, but have a great day, those of you watching, thank you as well. Good night.